Hello and welcome to worship at East Union on January 3rd. We have been on a journey. This is the sixth Sunday of Advent. And our journey through Advent has all been about that sense of movement. It's been a symbolic journey, which we're going to think about more today as we bring this to a close, the Advent season, and we move from Advent into Epiphany. So I welcome you to that, to this new shift. I want to say before we get started in our service today that if you have something that you would like to share with the congregation, with our church family, feel free to use the chat um, box that is at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over that, that will come up and you can send a chat to Joel or myself or Jerry and Lou or Janet and Doyle. And we'll make sure that that sharing happens. That will not be made public in the recording that is posted. So feel free to make sure that you do that so that we can have that in our sharing time later in the service. Throughout this journey of Advent, we've been moving closer to the heart of Jesus We've been on the road to readiness. We've been on the road to repentance, to restoration, and to revelation. Last Sunday, we were on the road to rejoicing. And this Sunday, I welcome you on to the road to radiance. Jesus, light of the world, has come and shed light on our journey. We are radiant in the light of his love and grace. Let's join for a moment of prayer. May our worship today open the window of our world. May we invite the fresh light of epiphany to flood us with hope, to bring us fresh insight and to fill us with grateful joy. May our eyes be open to the potential before us, to the continual unfolding into God's grace and expanding of our faith horizons. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to join me in the call to worship. You can feel free to... Um, Join in in the all portion or just read along with me throughout the entire thing too. This is adapted from Isaiah 60 and Psalm 72. Lift your eyes and look around. God delivers the needy when they call. Let your hearts thrill and rejoice. God will deliver the poor, and those who have no helper. The nations will bring gold and frankincense before the Lord. We shall see and be radiant, and we will proclaim the praise of the Lord. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, have gone. and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. O oh, beautiful star, beautiful, beautiful star of Bethlehem, star of Bethlehem. Shine upon us until the glory, glory dawn. And guide the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night. Over the mountain till the break of dawn, dawn, and into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, beautiful, beautiful star of Bethlehem, star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. 
into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of rest, for the redeemed, the good and blessed. Yonder in glory when the crown is won, is won. For Jesus is now that star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, beautiful, beautiful star of Bethlehem, star of Bethlehem. shine upon us until the glory, glory dawn. For Jesus is now that star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. That is a song that brings back lots of memories for me. I wonder if not for you too. Our announcements this Sunday, um, next week will be January 10th and immediately following our Sunday morning service, we invite you to join us for a virtual prayer walk around the church to just pray a blessing upon the work of the church over the next year. In addition, you have some opportunities starting next week of two different um, Zoom kind of learning, social gathering opportunities that um, will go throughout the winter. So one of those is remembering your story starts on January 12th and goes for several consecutive weeks after that on those Tuesday nights. And then the other one is creating together, which begins on January 21st. So I invite you to consider those. There's information, more information for you in the bulletin and such about those. Also Hillcrest Academy, uh, January 18th has both, both a visit day and then a prospective family night going on and some activity at the halftime basketball on the 22nd and the second for fifth to eighth graders. So keep that in mind. Children, we have two different children's times for you this Sunday again. What's coming next is your shine children's time. And so I invite you to grab your shine Bible and come closer to the screen and um, be ready to hear from our, some of our church family. So welcome to children's time. Good morning and Happy New Year. Welcome to Children's Time. I'm Sarah and I'm joined here by Greg, Ethan, and Nora. Today's Bible story comes from Mark 1, verse 1 through 10, and is titled, Jesus is Baptized. If you have your Shine Bible nearby, you can grab it and open it up. We will be reading from page 178 through 179. Let's recap the past few Sunday School lessons this quarter as it has been a busy past few weeks. We started with a lesson about a different kind of kingdom, followed by the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then when Mary shared her joy of her pregnancy. Then we celebrated the birth of Jesus and heard the story of the Magi. This week, we will experience the story of Jesus' baptism. Before we read today's Bible story, let's look at this map to see where today's story takes place. Nazareth is a small town in the area of Galilee, a little less than 100 miles from Jerusalem that Mary and Joseph lived in. It probably took, two, took four to five days to walk from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, then left Nazareth to go to the Jordan River to see John. Jerusalem is an important city because the king lived there. Many people traveled here to the temple to celebrate Jewish festivals. Zechariah and Elizabeth lived in a city in a village near the city of Jerusalem. Bethlehem was a small village south of Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. The Jordan River flowed from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. Some parts of the Jordan River went past towns, while other parts of the river flowed through the wilderness. Because much of it was sh shallow and it flowed slowly, it was a good place to baptize people. In our story today, crowds congregated around John the Baptist, seeking baptism in the Jordan River. Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John. When Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water. The heavens opened and the spirit descended like a dove. A voice from heaven called Jesus, my son, the beloved. And now Ethan will read today's Bible story. 
and you can turn in your Shine Bible to page 179 and follow along to the story of Jesus' baptism. Jesus is baptized. Many people heard about John the Baptist. They came to the Jordan River to find out what was happening. They heard John preach. They confessed their sins and were baptized by John in the river. People talked about John's clothes woven from camel hair. They talked about the desert foods he ate, locusts, and wild honey. Most most important, they talked about John's words. John had told them something new was happening. The one who is more powerful than I am, I is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John said, you should not be coming to me. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, no, it is right for you to baptize me now. So John agreed and he baptized Jesus in the river. As Jesus came out of the water, he saw the heavens open. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove and rested on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved, who with you I am well pleased. Now let's watch a short movie clip to illustrate our story today. soon be here, brother. Turn back to God. Baptism is a sign that you intend to live for God, so be alert. Someone more powerful than me is going to come. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In thinking about today, today's Bible story, let's reflect. I wonder why Jesus decided to be baptized. Could you imagine walking into the Jordan River and feeling the water swirl around your legs? And the water falling upon your head? I wonder who loves you and is pleased with you. I wonder what you think it means to be baptized. If possible, talk to an adult sometime this week about their baptism and their experiences. Let's end with a prayer. God, thank you that you care for each of us and that we are your beloved children. Help us know how we can change our hearts and lives to follow your way. Watch over us and care for us in the weeks to come. Amen. Once again, a reminder to you that this is our final Sunday of Advent. It's week six. And on this Advent journey, we are on the road to Radiance Now, basking in the glow of God that shines for the people of all nations. In a moment, we'll be hearing from Niall, our final monologue of this Advent season. And then following that, we have another children's time. So kids, you wanna stay close to the screen. Um, You have another opportunity to see and hear from some of our church family with an Advent oriented um, um, children's time also. But for now, we'll move into the monologue, the Magi seek the Messiah. This is based on Matthew 2. In my country, I am part of a group called the Magi. Sometimes we are called wise men or even holy men. At one time, we were a tribe of priests, but over time, this changed. Instead of devoting ourselves to the study of holy texts, we became skilled in philosophy, medicine, and the natural sciences. I myself study the heavens. People are always looking for answers. 
They look to us for many things. Some consider us soothsayers and interpreters of dreams. They believe we can foretell the future from the stars and that a man's destiny is determined by the star under which he is born. I can't say there isn't some truth to this, for the stars follow a natural rhythm of seasons and time. They represent order in a chaotic world. So I understand why people look to the heavens to find their answers. Many times I have followed the signs in the sky when traveling. One journey has stayed with me longer than any of the others, a journey to find a king. In the Egyptian month of Masori, an unusual star rose, shining with extraordinary brilliance. We understood this to signify the arrival of a king into the world, and we were not alone. In fact, the world seemed to be waiting in eager anticipation. Many cultures had a long established belief that at this time the East was going to grow powerful and a ruler would come out of Judea. The location of the star reinforced this direction. So some of my fellow Magi and I set out to follow the star and find this king. The journey was not quick or short, but we had prepared for the trip and we had the means to buy supplies along the way. Eventually, we find ourselves in the town of Jerusalem at the palace of the current ruler, Herod Antipas. Our arrival caused quite a stir, and upon hearing the reason for our visit, Herod sought counsel from the Jewish chief priests and scribes in Jerusalem. Herod wanted to know exactly where the anointed one of God was to be born. The Jewish leaders confirmed our understanding. It was foretold he would be born in Bethlehem in Judea. They quoted their religious texts. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the leaders of Judah. For from you will come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. After gaining this information, Herod, Herod, Herod met with us privately. He asked us for the exact time the star had appeared. We volunteered the information, but I felt a small sense of apprehension. In my studies, I spend a lot of time analyzing darkness and light. Usually I am observing them from the realm above, but there is also darkness and light on the earthly plane that is no less fascinating. It emanates from people's hearts and the nature of their character. People who live their lives in darkness or in light are easy to recognize. They can't help but show their true nature, but those who wander between light and darkness live in the shadows, half in darkness and half in light. They are more difficult to see and harder to understand. To me, Herod Antipas seemed to be such a man. He acted eager to send us on our way, even implored us to diligently search until we found the child. But then he said something I found strange. After we had found the child, he told us, report back to him so he himself could go and worship the king. Not only did this strike a note of insincerity, but the light in his eyes was full of shadows. What king worships his replacement? I was more than happy to return to the road and overjoyed to see the star still before us. We followed it to a humble cottage in the town of Bethlehem. Inside, we found a young child and his mother. Upon our entering the house, we knew without a doubt this was the child we sought. With great reverence, we bowed. Without an ounce of hesitation, we worshiped him. Once we had shown our respect, we unpacked the gifts we had brought the tiny king. Our gifts were gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the most valuable gifts our country had to offer. We were touched by the family's awe and delight in receiving them. Here I saw nothing of what we left at Herod's palace. No shadows, only warm, glorious light much like the star we followed. I was filled with wonder. When we finally left and retired for the evening, I expected to fall into a sound sleep. 
Instead, I had a restless night and woke with the remnants of a dream still with me. I soon discovered my companions had similar dream. In the dream, we were warned not to return to Herod's palace or report on the whereabouts of the child. We were in total agreement that the dream was a warning we would heed. We made our way home by a different route, giving Herod's palace a wide berth. The road home gave me time to reflect on everything I had seen. The darkness I had felt in Herod's presence was unnerving and chilling. The light I had felt in the presence of the child destined to be a king was luminous and incandescent. Do you remember before when I told you people are always looking for answers? Over the years, I have learned many things in my travels. I have seen many more. I always seem to be on one road or another, but no matter what road I'm on, I always follow the light. What about you? Okay, good morning East Union. I have Simon and Reed, and we're gonna share a children's story with you today. All right, so Simon, cold winter day like today, after playing in the snow and your cheeks are cold, what do you like to do? Um, have hot cocoa. Have hot cocoa, okay. Reed, would you also like some hot cocoa to warm up? Okay. All right, you, one scoop. All right, put it in the, yep, how do we make, yep, we got this. My cocoa. All right. Reed, you dump your scoop in. Okay, now, is your glass, is it warm? Can we touch it? Is it warm yet? How does it feel? Warm. Cold? Okay, I think it, does it feel cold? Okay, what else do we need? Okay, all right. Okay, stir it up. Now, if you put your hands around your cup like this, how does that make your hands feel? Hot? Does that warm you up? Reed, does that warm you up? Does it feel hot? Yeah. Yeah, that's hot. All right, and yes, we needed the water to make it work. Now, during this time, what are some things that we have done that you've enjoyed, Simon? Have we... The candles each night for at and had a story. <laughs> Simon. Dad. And did we read Dad, Bible stories? Dad, yeah. I, I want my hot cocoa out. Good. Okay. Yeah. And just like you blew the candles out for us each night, mm -hmm. and we also read scripture. We sang songs. We had a Christmas Eve service. We did all of those things so that we could also be warmed up and experience God's love. Just like adding the hot water, we could then feel God's goodness and warm up. And when we're warm and secure in God's love, we have something to share with others. Just like you can share a cup of hot cocoa with your friends and your family and others. So, we encourage everyone at home to maybe share a warm cup of hot cocoa this morning so we can be reminded of God's love. All right, can you say goodbye? Bye. Bye. Thank you to Simon and Reed and Caleb. We come to the time of our worship where we dedicate the offerings and gifts that are given. Just a reminder to you that you can do continue to do that despite um, not meeting in person. You can do that through mail, through the website, or through the app that is provided. For the dedication and offerings of gifts, could you please join with me in prayer? Father, you give us so much. In your generosity, you even gave us your son. Our offerings fail to reflect the awe we hold and our recognition of you and this giving. Yet, we bring these offerings to you with hearts of love. 
we bring these offerings and dedicate them to fulfill your work and the work of your people. We bring these offerings and pray that your will be done. We bring them with prayers that you will continue to give us bright stars of epiphanies that continue to move us closer to your heart. Thank you for your generosity to us, Father. In your name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 2, 1 through 12, and you can follow along with me as I read this. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet and you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. We now welcome Joel with our message for this morning. Well, good morning. It is good to be worshiping online with you this morning. Jesus, light of the world, has come and shed light on our journey. We are radiant in the light of his love and grace. This morning, I was wondering if you remember or recall when you were younger, um, how it felt to hang from the monkey bars and maybe put your legs over the monkey bars and hang upside down and feel the rush of blood going to your head and the world around you, although still familiar, is upside down, a little bit bewildering. And when you finally right yourself, when you finally stand up or get right side up, all the blood rushes away and you have that moment of, of sort of dizziness, of unsteadiness, that woozy feeling. Or maybe when you got on a tire swing and, and swung around and around, or, or maybe got on a merry-go-round and just went around so fast, and depending on the size, you know, of that merry-go-round, um, the number of times that you'd whip around could make you so dizzy that you feel maybe even a little bit nauseous, disoriented. And when you step off, the, the ground underneath you felt unsteady. Or for me now, personally, I would only feel queasy. I, I don't think I could do it anymore. Sometimes I feel just that way, <laughs> standing upright. Um, but that feeling, that sense of the ground being unsteady, a little off kilter, I want you to hold that this morning in your mind's eye. Now, this next example is maybe for some of our younger folks watching, but if you've ever played what they call a first person video game, uh, these days, the graphics are so good that if you rotate your character or quickly look in lots of diff different directions, you'll achieve the same sort of 
sense of disequilibrium, this sense of being almost dizzy, as if your, your head was spinning around to take in the view around you. Imagine now how the Magi may have felt perceiving a celestial phenomenon, traveling hundreds of miles, encountering King Herod in a palace and King Jesus as a baby in a cottage or in a barn or, or someplace very humble. That same ground that we're talking about that, that may have felt unsteady to them, it may have created disequilibrium for them. They could have felt a little disoriented, maybe even shook. We often talk about the kingdom of God as the upside down kingdom. But I wonder if we really think about the implications of, of that statement, what it means to have an upside down kingdom. If we consider it literally, we may imagine a, a place or a state of being in which the blood is too forcefully shoved into your head, pushed towards our heads, a place where the, the very ground itself feels unsteady a place and a way of being that forces us to look at the world in a new way, like in a way that we've maybe never looked at it before. Far from being soothing, it, it could actually be a little bit unnerving, unsettling. And these magi from this far off and distant land, they continue the story of disruption that Jesus's birth really is on the way things have always been or how the things really are. We've been receiving several of these messages over the last several weeks, including uh, messages from the prophet Isaiah, his multiple proclamations of the Messiah, or in Mary's immaculate conception and her song and her, her amazing faithfulness to see Jesus's birth come to its completion. Last week during the monologue, we heard from Anna in the temple and she told us of Simeon's words to Mary as found in Luke 2, 34 to 35, when he said, uh, when it says, then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The moral of the story is, is that getting turned upside down, it sounds exactly like we remember it. It's a little disorienting. Equal parts thrilling and terrifying at the same time. And there's always that moment that you're a little bit unsure if, if you're really enjoying it as much as you thought you would or initially imagined. Or are you simply becoming uncomfortable or even nauseated. The Magi, I see them as being seekers. They found a phenomenon that they could not explain, some celestial occurrence that did not make complete sense to them. And so they wanted to seek out the answer. You know, as humans, we, we are sometimes curious to a fault. If we discover something that we cannot fully explain, we, we almost find this desire, this, this uh, nagging urge to find the answer. If you don't believe me, ask uh, Christine or, or, or our boys how long it takes me to Google it. Too often I'm kindly asked to refrain from searching my iPhone for the answer to what uh, the difference, for example, between a stalactite or a stalagmite may be. Don't worry, I Googled it. A stalactite is an icicle-shaped formation that hangs from the ceiling of a cave and is produced by precipitation of minerals from water dripping through the cave ceiling. A stalagmite is an upward growing mound of minerals deposits that have precipitated from water dripping onto the floor of a cave. But I digress. The magi are, are simply like so many of us, right? They're, they're curious. They're, they're, they were not eagerly awaiting the, the arrival of the Messiah for the people of Israel. They, they were investigating the stars and planetary alignments. They were, they were looking at the phenomenon around them and, and noticing the signs and paying attention. 
and they were curiously following after this, whatever this celestial phenomenon may have been. Maybe it was like the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter that some of us observed a few weeks back. The reality is, is that, that Matthew demonstrates to us this, this full magnitude of this upside down kingdom over which Jesus will reign. Even the stars themselves align to indicate his presence. It's so impressive that people from afar with no prior knowledge will seek him out and pay him respect. And this is the beginning of, of, of Jesus' coming into the world. And yet we already see clearly uh, the upside down nature of that kingdom, of what it's going to be like. Those who should easily recognize his arrival, King Herod, the chief priests, scholars, right? They, they are oblivious. In essence, King Herod and the scholars could, could have done the equivalent of a modern day Google search, right? They had the text right in front of them, um, but they, they chose not to. They, they could have found out where the Messiah was located, but they, they chose to be oblivious. Instead, as, as one commentator put it, Quote, when they get a whiff that the scripture might actually be taking on flesh, they recoil and lash out defensively. The account in Matthew, it, it even suggests that the people of Jerusalem themselves maybe have been frightened by this announcement. What does it mean that those of us who would wait for Jesus's arrival and his appearance that, we, that those of us that seek him every day, that we would fail to find him when he actually arrives on the scene. What, what does it mean that shepherds and magi are able to seek him out and find him and recognize him and understand the full implication of his arrival when so many around him, Jesus did not? I think about that as we consider finding Jesus in our own lives. I wonder sometimes how I may be blind to Jesus's full presence here and now in the midst of, of our daily lives. Maybe we can recognize our encounter with Christ when we are like the Magi, drawn to seek him out at all costs, ready to lay down our most valuable possessions, Gold, frankincense, myrrh, what, what's your possession that you're willing to lay down? And unable to return the way that we first came. At the end of this illustration of the Magi, Matthew says that they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod and that they left their own country by another road, a different route, right? Whether they needed the warning or not, the Magi were unable to return the road upon the road that they came on. Maybe it's a little bit like uh, James C. Howell puts it, quote, could it be that Matthew is offering us a tantalizing hint about life for those who have met Christ? Nothing is ever the same again. You don't take the old road any longer. You unfold a new map and discover an alternate path. It's more than a rush of blood to the head it's more than being a little bit woozy on the merry-go-round, but encountering Christ, it is life-changing. It is life-altering. Encountering Christ, in encountering Christ, we, we can't simply go back to the way things were, go back the way that we came. In some ways, I'm imagining that encountering Christ may have been a little bit like this past year with the crisis of the pandemic. Maybe the, the encounter with Christ is so disruptive that we cannot possibly return to life as normal. Maybe Jesus extracts the full meaning of, of life, of being human. And, and when we catch a glimpse, we can't, everything else is bland. It's, it's, it's leftovers. We, we can't go back to the way things simply were. The poet uh, T.S. Eliot imagined the thoughts of the Magi when they were in their homes. He, he thinks of it this way. He, he says, we return to our places, but no longer at ease here 
in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. Imagine the Magi that returning home and, and, and feeling like this just isn't home anymore. It, it, something's different. It doesn't have the same uh, comfort that it once held. Encountering Christ is, is disrupted their way of thinking and they want more. The full reality of Jesus's birth is that it, his arrival, it, it is a call to all people to seek him out. Anyone, everyone, all people to be drawn to him. All those with eyes to see, all those with ears to hear. Anyone receptive to God's inbreaking kingdom can find him. But this isn't idle talk, though. It's earth shattering, life changing. It's life revealing. Jesus doesn't come to make us more comfortable and successful and and maybe like the Magi, when we encounter Jesus, we no longer feel quite so comfortable in a world that does not recognize Jesus. Maybe we begin to see the alien people clutching their gods. Maybe we begin to detect the naysayers and the pretenders, the, the false prophets who use smoke and mirrors to um, make us think that they're doing all this great and wonderful things for for, for Christ, but in reality, they're just amassing wealth and power at the expense of the gospel. East Union, Jesus, light of the world, has come and shed light on our journey. Even if that journey means taking roads that feel less familiar, even if we cannot fully understand where we are headed, may we be radiant radiant in the light of Christ's love and grace. May it be so. Lands of the east, we have traveled afar, led on by the gleam of the beautiful star. Through deserts or mountains, rough, rugged, and bleak, we journey rejoicing, Messiah we seek. Oh, the star, the beautiful star, we're onward proceeding, unmindful, unheeding, all else but the leading of yonder bright gem. Oh, the star, the beautiful star, we're onward proceeding, unmindful, unheeding, all else but the leading of yonder bright gem. The skies bending o'er us, unite in the Excited. Uh, we have a, another Signs of Hope again this uh, Sunday, but it's actually going to be a year in review. And again, I just thank um, Sarah Yoder and Nora Yoder and uh, Tushan and others and all of you who sent in pictures and videos this year. We want to continue doing this, but um, just so thankful. Uh, Signs of Hope for me has been a really 
uh, meaningful part of our worship services the last nine months, and, and I hope you have enjoyed them too. So enjoy Signs of Hope in review.
Now receive this benediction blessing. People of God, people on the road, arise and shine. Go forth in the radiance of God, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Go in peace. We thank you for worshiping with us online. It's good to have each of you with us. And this does conclude our Sunday morning service.